con inspiración estos versos que son cosa verdad o ciencia ficción y a don Rolando y no cosa le dedico mi canción verso de espejas es cuna de don Rolando y no cosa siendo uno de los mejores Conocido y más fecundo de los escritores buenos chicanos. Well, I was born in Mercedes on the 21st of January, 1929, and I'm the youngest of five, three of whom survive. My father was Manuel Guzman Hinojosa, and he was born in a ranch called Campacuas, just a few miles north of Mercedes. Uh, the Anglos called it Carter's Lake, but it was an old Mexican name, Campacuas. And my mother was among the first uh, Texas Anglo families to come down to the valley. She was born in Rockport on the coast, but she got to the valley at age six. And I was very fortunate to have not only been born in Mercedes into a family of readers, because both my mother, mother and father and all my brothers and sisters read, um, but also because I lived in one place for a long time and that's very necessary for a writer. I think I was 15. Uh, I had written something called Estampas Artiagenses. It's a little village of 1,200 people in, our, in, in the state of Coahuila, Artiaga, Coahuila. And I wrote about two campesinos and the uh, Mexican government and the army uh, came after them and killed both of them and their blood splattered all over the irrigation ditches and went all over Mexico. It was very symbolic, and I was 15. And I wrote it in Spanish. Well, that same year, uh, when I was a junior in high school, and subsequently when I was a senior, I wrote uh, for something called Creative Bits, which are essays or short stories for the high school. You're eligible as a junior and a senior. And those five or six pieces are all in the Mercedes Library right now. They save them every year, and the program is called Creative Bits, and as far as I know, I was just there recently, uh, they still have the contest, which is terrific. And I was hooked. I was hooked because I think I won honorable mention. Not only was I selected to appear in the anthology, I received honorable mention, and I think that did it for me. And to repeat that to come from a family of readers was indeed fortunate. It is for a writer. You have to learn how to love to read, and my mother read to my dad, and my dad would then read to my mother at times. And I read a lot of frivolous literature, but it was good literature. Uh, but it was very light, but very solid writing by James Thurber and uh, S.J. Perlman and Corey Ford, and, uh, Dorothy Parker. <clears throat> Even though I'd never been out of the valley, I was reading The New Yorker and reading their fiction and everybody else's fiction. But I also read a lot of the popular uh, books of the time by popular writers such as uh, Lloyd Douglas, and uh, who wrote White Banners, Green Mansions, Magnificent Obsession, The Big Fisherman, and, or The Shoes of the Fisherman, something like that. And um, of course, I read the 19th century Americans with, uh, particularly Poe, because I liked the short story at the time. And he was a, he's a master and the inventor of the short story. And uh, Sam Melville. And then a smattering of the English, particularly Shakespeare, although I didn't understand a word of it until much later. I began to appreciate it. So a lot of frivolous lit, a lot of popular lit, and some serious literature. But at the same time, I was also reading in Spanish, particularly Mexican writers, and some Mexican, uh, Texas Mexican valley writers like Pepe Diaz and Américo Paredes, uh, who wrote either for the Herald or for La Prensa, which was published out of San Antonio, and sent all over Texas by rail. And they had on Monday mornings in La Prensa, because I sold La Prensa, something called Los Lunes Literarios, the literary supplement for Monday. And here were all these people who were writing, men and women, some from the valley, others from other parts of Texas. And then translations. I didn't know that Balzac was French, because I only read him in Spanish. Or uh, I just thought that Guy de Maupassant had a strange name for a Spaniard, but. I was reading them in translation. I had no idea, so I was reading these people. So it's been a lifetime of study and, uh, and interest, of course. 
And that's a lifelong habit. And if you wish to write, and if you want to be a writer, then you have to be a reader. There's just so much that imagination can take you, but imagination begins to flag after a while. So you have to have a grounded background. I was also fortunate in living there for this time that I was telling you because um, the culture was always with me every day. You know, I got up and the sun rose by the same palm tree every morning, you know, and the sun set on the same, on another palm tree <laughs> facing the different direction. The stores were the same, the houses were the same, the people were the same. And it gives you a sense of continuity and a sense of belonging. And I wrote an essay called A Writer's, or This Writer's Sense of Place, in which I focus directly on my life in Mercedes and in the Rio Grande Valley as great determinants and due, of course, to the strong uh, culture. I was also fortunate that I could speak English and Spanish at the same time, mother being a Texas Anglo and my father being a Texas Mexican. So uh, spending time in every summer in Mexico and then going to school nine months here in the States, uh, just it was a nice symbiotic relationship. They just blended in. Um, I was 10 years old when Hitler and the Nazi and the Wehrmacht invaded Poland. And I was 16 when uh, MacArthur and the Japanese signed the peace accord uh, in September uh, of 1945. So to grow up and spend six years of daily bombardment by Paramount News or RKO Path A News and, uh, and all the heavy propaganda, of course, I had to eschew a lot of that later on in my 20s and 30s that they weren't all monsters and that we weren't all very nice about it either. But uh, I think I got a very fair uh, view of it. So I took this abiding interest in, in Europe and in the Orient. And uh, this reflected mostly in my writing. And so I travel a lot and I lecture a lot. And uh, my stuff has been translated in, into Dutch and German and French, of course, English and Spanish. And theses are written overseas also as well as in this country. So my interest is, of course, is that uh, of a writer, but one who was uh, greatly influenced because from ages 10 to 16, which is very formative in anyone's career or anyone's life, uh, this catastrophe happened for six years and uh, day after day after day. And I think that accounts for it. And there was always conversation and talk about college. Now, you're going to go to college, and that was a given. It was just talking about college or university work. And no, no question at all. What helped us, of course, was GI Bill. The GI Bill helped uh, many Americans win uh, or earn some sort of uh, college work. And we certainly took advantage of that. And many other Mexican Americans did too. I still have many friends, uh, who, my roommates, uh, some of them still live around the state, and uh, I keep up with some of them. And uh, they were very pleasant for me. Uh, I enjoyed it. I had a great time. I think being from the Rio Grande Valley is a big help. You know exactly who you are if you come from the valley, and you know what you are when you come from the valley. And most of the um, guys who were going to school here, and the women too, were valley people. Um, I think of the uh, two or three Mexican-American roommates I had, they were all from the valley, from Brownsville, uh, from Mission, and from Rio Grande City. And I worked for the university. I worked four years at the library. So I had a very pleasant time. I had my money from the GI Bill. I had money from the university. I also earned money as a tutor and translating uh, papers or whatever. So it was a busy time and a very happy time. Besides. As I tell my undergraduates now, and have been forever, if you can't have fun as an undergraduate, then you'll never have fun. <laughs> in 1960, um, a chemical plant had closed in Brownsville, and uh, I was out of a job. So I returned to high school teaching. And then a friend of mine uh, told me about a federal service entrance exam. This is 61, so I took it, passed it, and I said, I'm going to work for the government for 18 months, save as much as I can in those 18 months, and then go to graduate school. I was already 31, I think, and I did. I taught at high school. I took my civil service exam, and I worked for the Social Security Administration, 
the station in Houston, Corpus, finally in Brownsville, and that's when I really saved the money. And I resigned, and I had this savings, and I went to New Mexico Highlands. But I loved the little place, and when I had saved my money, and I returned there, and I went one summer, and one long term, and another summer, and I got my uh, MA. In the meantime, I was already making preparations to, uh, to go to graduate school. So I applied to Chapel Hill and to Michigan and uh, Illinois and various other places. And I finally chose Illinois. I, I, liked, I think they had the best economic deal for me. Besides, that's the school I really wanted to go to. My advisor had some friends there. And Luis Leal, uh, a great old man of uh, Mexican and world literature, uh, was there. And I wanted to work with him. And I did. In fact, we even shared an office. So, uh, but in 63 is when I started Illinois. In 68, or when I left and then got my degree in 69 here at Trinity, uh, the Chicano movement was fermenting, either at universities or in the political arena outside of the universities, but also literarily. So I said, well, I'll make my contribution as a writer. And I did, along with Tomás Rivera, another Texan. Not a Valleyite, he's from the Winter Garden area in Crystal City. So we participated in that, and we uh, garnered a lot of money, uh, particularly from the Ford uh, Foundation. And we secured master's and PhD uh, opportunities for many young men and women who otherwise would have probably received their BA, and that's about it, or their BS if they were in science, and that would have been the end of their career to go into high school teaching. As it is, many of them are now in their 40s uh, because of the efforts that we did in the late 60s, all the way up to around 77, I think. And in the meantime, of course, the Texas legislature is increasing in its membership as far as Mexican Americans are concerned. Mexican American literature really takes off with publishing houses, which are still, um, you know, a going concern today. And it was a very exciting time. But every decade really is an exciting time. It's just that things conjugated in the 60s. There was a larger cadre of educated Mexican-American men and women. And as a Valleyite, I got to know many of them. And, and a former uh, colleague and good friend named Danny Rodriguez at Trinity said, I want you to, to meet Tomás Rivera. And I said, my goodness, I wanted to meet him. And two weeks ago, I missed him. We didn't go to the conference that day. We walked for about four hours. We missed the lunch. We missed every lecture. And all we did was talk about ourselves and about writing and how interested I was. And, I hadn't published the line up to that time, and now I was already 41 years old, I think. And he said, send me some, some of your stuff, and I did. Well, to uh, cut it short, he died in uh, 1984. And in fact, I, w I went to his grave site again this year, as I do every year, usually in May, because that's the month that he died. Uh, and he's buried in Crystal City. Uh, I think we lectured in maybe 20 or 30 universities together in the space of uh, 14 or 15 years. I received I don't know how many letters from um, friends and colleagues from all over the U.S. Uh, letters of condolence and saying, I know how much you miss Tomas, and this is a great loss, uh, but, and we want you to know that our heart goes with you, as if you know, I had lost a brother. Actually, I had lost one of the dearest friends I'd ever had. Most writers write about what they don't. Uh, trouble is, you have to know what it is that you do know. In this piece that I will read for you, it's called Es el Agua. My name is Fructuoso Alaniz Garcia, and I was so named for my Saints Day, the 21st day of January. In English, according to my granddaughter Lucia, my name means bountiful, productive. I find it proper that one so named should be chosen to work the land and to know it and to give it life so that it, the land, return part of that life in grain and cereal, in vegetables, yes, in fruits of labor and of bounty to that person who prepared the land and watched the crops grow from nothing but a hope and a handful of seeds. We have a saying here in the Rio Grande Valley, es el agua, it's the water, the Rio Grande water. It claims you, you understand it's yours and you belong to it too. No matter where we work, we always come back to the border, to the valley, it's el agua, yeah. The valley is a good place. It's hard, sure, seguro, but 
But there's farm work, and one just has to be harder than the work. And the valley is different, too, and it makes us different somehow. When we leave it to go to the Yakima Valley or to Oregon for the hops in Nampa in Idaho, we're home there, too. Why? Well, because the workers there are valley people. Yeah. And kids who have never seen the valley say they're from there because that's where their folks are from. They said, Agua. Their parents talk about the valley, see, and the kids know. This is changing, of course, but everything changes. It's in the nature of things. I'll show you. When my wife and I and our friends picked cotton, and this is just an example, we picked in the valley from June to August, and then the owner plowed the ground up in September. Well, by late August, some of us would go to Central Texas to pick, or to West Texas in October and November, to places like Brownfield and La Mesa. Sometimes we'd go to Arkansas or to Missouri for cotton, and to Tennessee, but not now. And not for some 20 years either. Machines do it. But they can't do everything. No, you still need la mano de obra, the human hand, the eye to see and to distinguish. Machines don't take pride in what they do. They can't, but we did and do. Yeah. Well, work is work, and most of it is hard, but that's expected. What's a bother and shameful, too, is where one has to live in the American Midwest, in our cars, or in the trucks, or on the ground, in a carpa, a tent, or in chicken and turkey coops, and these are the worst. Terrible. It isn't always like that, but even once is enough, believe me. But one endures, one survives, and one even survives and endures racismo and prejuicio, racism and prejudice from everybody, including our own. But I can't change it, and God won't, as we say. Pero tampoco nos rajamos. We won't crack and we won't throw up our hands and say, I give up. No, no nos rajamos y ya. We won't give up and that's it. But after all the work and travel, it's back to the valley for more work. Es el agua, mía. Hmm. Those who claim hard work never killed anybody are fooling themselves and their friends. Hard work is hard. That's why they call it that. It's killing, but there's a certain kind of pride, a foolish pride perhaps, and unexplainable too, but, but our family is proud of what it does and what it can do. It's like when I was in France 60 years ago. One was there and one stayed there until they said, let's go, let's go home. And that's the way it is when we are in Indiana or Iowa or in the Red River Valley of Minnesota. One is there, then someone says, let's go, let's go home to Texas, home to the valley. I said, Agua. I didn't have a title for this, so I asked the woman editor to give me a title, and she just calls it Remembrance of My Father. And this has to do with my dad. <clears throat> he wore a tie and he shaved every day of the week except Sunday. Oh, he wore a tie then too, but he didn't shave himself on Sunday. My mother did that. And I used to watch. I sit on their bed and watch mom shave him while he carried on a monologue that ranged far and wide. No direct course, just whatever he thought about or had read that Sunday morning, and then he'd start from there. Mom would return from early mass by 8 o'clock. Dad would be waiting for his shave, and I'd be sitting on the bed. And that Sunday was special. The papers were using the term Generalissimo as a title for Francisco Franco. The usurper, my dad called him, and dad, who hated Franco, also hated the word generalissimo and the idea that Franco should take that title for himself. Demasiado, he'd say. Too much. He didn't much like it when Chiang Kai-shek from China was called that either. But for Franco the usurper to use it, why? That was pura pedanteria, his favorite phrase. Pure pedantry and bombast. And dad would carry on for a while and turn his head toward me. He said, pedanteria, he'd say. And my mom, ever ready for those sudden jerking abouts of his head, would lift that honed straight razor and I'd sit there wondering why his head didn't just lop off into his knees. Hmm, <laughs> he'd say. Hmm, generalissimo, is it? That mequetrefe, that jackass. Because that's what he is, Sonny. And no one or before has ever called me Sonny. A usurper, he'd say. <laughs> and now calling himself a generalissimo and the damn fool press going along with it. Hmm. How about that cuñado of his, that brother-in-law? You know what we ought to call him? I'll tell you what we ought to call him. Cuñadísimo. That's right. <laughs> A damn fool press. And then he'd go on insulting Franco, remembering the Mexican Revolution, where, among other things, he sold horses and he also gambled for a living. And after my mother would finish the shave, he would look at me and say, are you ready? And I'd say, yes, because it was a formula every Sunday. And then mother would 
pass him the Mexican alcohol and he'd say, Carrie, let's take this boy over to the Victor's for some coffee and biscuits. And then the best for last, he'd give me a wink and a smile. Let me read something in Spanish, just a brief thing. This is called Con el Pie en el Estribo. The title comes from the prologue that Cervantes wrote to the second part of uh, Don Quixote. In fact, when that novel was published, or that part, the second part of the novel was published, he was already dead. But he left it as a lovely thing. In English, Con el Pie en el Estribo is the closest thing we have to going west. That is, when you're just about to die. And Cervantes sensed that. Uh, I picked up a, uh, an old man. I have a, a, a recurring character who is now, actually he's 87, but he, and when he talks here, he thinks he's 83. He's lost a few years along the way. <laughs> and his name is Esteban Echevarria, and he's typical of the old who knew better times when he was a young man. And even though there's been progress made, he thinks that the present is rotten and it was always better in the old days. Yeah. And so uh, he begins Casas sin corredores, calles sin faroles, amigos que mueren. Jóvenes que ya no hablan español ni saben saludar. Hmm. Desaparece el valle, gentes. Los bolillos con sus propiedades, sus bancos y contratos, sí. Gente que no reconoce un choque de mano como cosa legal. Farmacéuticos con títulos, pero sin experiencia en la materia. Rancheros que no labran y pueblerinos con corbata. Hmm. Y pensar que en mis tiempos se sabía más que ahora con sus radios y teléfonos y sus vistas, sí. Tiempos malos fueron aquellos también, con sus rinches, la ley aprovechada, los terratenientes y las sequías. Al fin y al cabo era mi tiempo, mi gente, mi valle querido. Antes de que hubiera tal cosa como el condado de Belken y Cleo City y todo lo demás. Había gente, Rafa, labores y rancherías y ese río grande que era para beber y no para detenerlos de un lado contra el otro, no. Eso vino después con la boleada y sus ingenieros y el papelaje, todo en inglés, no... No te lo niego, no, y ni para qué negarlo, pero también hubo raza traicionera. Raza que jodía a la raza, y gratis, por el mero gusto de jodernos los unos a los otros. La miscones, coyotes, chupa sangre, nuestra enfermedad nacional. Pero el sol nacía y el sol se ponía y todo el mundo sabía lo que hacía. Bola de sinvergüenzas. Gente tramposa que no tenía palabra ni cara con qué sostenerla. Gente con modales suaves y de trato feo. Gente que se vendía en las elecciones, o que chaqueteaba por un plato de barbacoa y un par de cervezas. Pero eran pocos, sí. Los más eran gentes con sombreros de petate bien sudados. Gente trabajada y engañada por mucho tiempo y por todo el mundo. Gente incrédula y llena de fe. Gente no letrada pero con la cultura en las uñas. Gente del valle, Rafa. Este valle tan llevado y tan traído. Gente que a pulso ganó la tierra y que a paso lento la fue perdiendo. Gente que por fin se fue para el norte para no volver. Barrios abandonados. Y quién sabrá si eso también no haya sido una bendición. Mm. Amigos y patrones al pozo y yo en rumbo. Me acuerdo. Carne seca colgada en los alambres de la lavada y cabritos que se mataban en los solares. Árboles llenos de higos y de miel de abejas que chupaban la flor de naranjos. Ruidos de animales que ya no se oyen ni se ven. Bailes con gente invitada. Y ahora me cuentan que se tiene que pagar la entrada, pero te das cuenta, Raf. Y ahí están las palmeras. Las palmeras que se daban en el valle y que crecían como Dios quería, hasta que la abueliada vino con sus hachas y las cortaron como si tal cosa. Parece mentira. Ahora ellos mismos venden palmas para sembrar. Qué bonito. ¿Quién los entiende, sí, vendiendo palmas para sembrar? Si ellos fueron los que las cortaron. Palmas que se doblaban pero que no cedían. Palmas que perdían hojas y nacían otras hasta que vinieron las hachas. Así como la gente. Y las guerras, Rafa. La guerra de tu padre aquí en el valle, la de tus hermanos en el overseas. Y las otras guerras de ellos, a las cuales siempre me inmiscuyo. Valle, valle, ¿quién te ha visto y quién te ve? Yo soy del valle, tengo el honor, como decía la vieja canción. Y ahora, nada. Me voy y tú te quedas, Rafa. Muchacho joven que vives entre los viejos y con sus viejos recuerdos. Well, it's pretty hard to say 
things about Rolando and Rosa that have not been said already. Uh, the fact that uh, his humor, uh, the way that he has created a fictional, uh, if a fictional community or rather whole county, and the way he uses the language, he is truly bilingual and bicultural. I would agree that he is the best we have. He had a precursor, uh, Tomás Rivera, who unfortunately died uh, young, but uh, from there on, I think he stands out head and shoulders above our Mexico Tejano writers. I have uh, the best job in the world for me. I, uh, I teach where I want to be teaching, the University of Texas at Austin. I teach what I like to teach, and that's what I specialized in. And I'm a writer, and I get paid for it. And I get to lecture in Spain, Germany, all over the United States, Mexico, Cuba, France, you know, the Netherlands. And I don't know how many people at my age can still say, I'm very happy at my job. And I am. I'm quite happy. And uh, as soon as I see the tower every morning when I come in, and I come in every day, even though I don't teach every day, uh, it's a sense of belonging. So uh, this is my valley now. This is, I have a sense of place about the university, the way I have a sense of place of the Rio Grande Valley, which has always been my first love anyway. <laughs> Entre la piedra las cosas 